Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, we looked at a bunch of use cases in the financial services industry. So now we're going to switch gears and look at another major industry that blockchain uh, is slated to, to transform. Right? So this is the supply chain and logistics industry. So this is an area where my colleagues and I have been very working with multiple clients, uh, both in India and uh, outside. On, on a variety of use cases. Right? So over the next three lectures, we'll be talking about a number of use cases in the uh, log trade logistics and supply chain side. So this is about revolutionizing global trade. So global trade, as you know, is, is about shipping goods from one country to another. And this is an industry that has seen very little technological penetration right over the even through even in the internet age right so there's very little technological penetration there's a lot of paper documents manual effort that's needed so we talked about the financing side of trade so how the money would reach from the importer to the exporter now we're going to talk about the actual shipping of goods of how they go from the exporter to the importer so there is a, a path the cargo will take so it could go on a on a truck on a ship and then it might be in a warehouse for some time, and then it will get to the other end. So I'm here taking an example of a shipment going from Kenya to Holland. And apart from the goods, there's also a document path. And what happens sometimes is because the documentation is, is so complicated and, and people don't know exactly uh, what documents are required, what might end up happening is you'll have nine documents prepared, you'll go to the authority and say, hey, this is the shipment I have. And then the authority will say, hey, you're missing this one document. And then someone will actually go on a scooter. This is actually reality. Right? They will actually go on a scooter, uh, go to the other uh, place and, and try and prepare that other document. And because of all these delays, what might end up happening is the shipment actually reaches the other end faster than, they actually, than the documents go through. And once they reach on the other end, then there are, there's real estate costs that you're paying because the shipment is now in the yard at the uh, import country's port. And it's just waiting there, right? And each day it's waiting there, there is a cost associated with it because you have to pay for the warehousing uh, cost there. So what ends up happening is people actually then end up shipping the, the documents by first class air freight. So while the goods take them, go, go, them, go, go over sea, maybe taking, taking a week or 10 days, the documents are then flown first class just to avoid some of the additional cost. And it's estimated that about 15% of all the import-export cost involved is actually just spent in couriering the, the documents across to the other end because the documents have been delayed. And there's a huge potential saving uh, if we can improve, uh, if, you, if we can go from paper documents to electronic documents. And that estimate is, uh, is estimated to be $27 billion per year. It's based on the World Shipping Council data. And uh, the according to the World Economic Forum, uh, this is back in 2013, so the numbers are probably even higher now. If all countries improve their border administration and the, the transport and, and paperwork, even to half of what is considered global best practice, right? Even half of it. We are not even considering people reaching what was considered best practice. Even if you reach about half of that, then you could still save about $100 trillion a year. So that's the enormity of this, of this industry, of how it's, it's fundamental for every other industry to perform, to, to, to carry on. Who are the parties involved? So as I mentioned, there's, there's the exporter and the importer, of course. There may be their respective banks are involved because they're, they're part of the financing. There may be uh, customs authorities from both countries. So these are import customs, export customs. There could be other authorities also involved. Um, maybe this is a horticulture authority who is going to certify that the mangoes are actually uh, of good quality and they're okay to, to export. And of course, there are ports, there are freight forwarders, there are agents in between. And in between, there are also like people like ground handling agents at the uh, port and at the, maybe the, if there is a air, uh, air shipment, there's a ground handling agency. So there's many of these participants who are involved end to end. And almost nobody Actually, in fact, nobody in this picture has a complete view of everything that's happening. So it's always like A is talking to B, B is talking to C, C is talking to D, and so on, right? It's a long chain that way, right? And each person has their local view of things. I might know one or two hops from what I do, but I don't have a picture of what happens end to end. So for the exporter and the importer, they have actually no idea what is really happening, right? So that's, uh, that becomes problematic. 
So that's on the cargo path. Then there's the document path where again multiple parties have to prepare several documents. There are many approvals that needs to be obtained both in the import country and, the, and in the export country. And for the cargo path, what today's world what happens is people exchange messages. So these might be EDI messages, they might just be emails sometimes. They're all messages that are exchanged in a point-to-point -point manner between parties who are interacting in this end-to-end -end ecosystem. So there are, there's the actual goods that are being shipped, there are documents that are flowing, there are events to be recorded, and there could be other events also. For instance, let's say uh, I'm actually shipping uh, meat from India to, to Europe. Now the meat needs to be refrigerated. So this might be a refrigerated container where you're actually tracking the temperature of the goods. Or this might be fragile equipment for, me, for which there might be like pressure sensors. All, all these uh, are already in place today, but there's not a very easy way of tracking this or even providing that visibility to anyone else. Right? So those, it might also be events coming in from IoT devices. So that, that's what I wanted to mention here. And this is all apart from the finance flow that I talked about, from the importer's side to the exporter. So there's a cargo path, document path. It could be other events uh, pertaining to the cargo, uh, whether it is uh, messages exchanged or IoT uh, information, and of course, the financial flow. Now, what we want to ensure with blockchain is ensure that there are secure data exchanges. So when data is being ex exchanged, you can ensure who gets to see this information. Uh, so you can provide that visibility. Um, you can also ensure that no one is tampering with that information because it's on blockchain, it's secure there. So that's the tamper-proof documents and digital signatures. So documents can be signed to say that this particular entity uploaded this document. And this authority was the one who signed off this document. And that's valuable for the import customs. For instance, the import customs now has a guarantee that it has actually come from the authority on the other end. So it has actually come from the government agency and they can verify those signatures. The whole workflow can be automated and that brings in significant benefits. So it's not going to be that, uh, it, this also happens, right? So a container gets left in a warehouse and then people lose track of it. And then people go around searching where the container is. That happens also. Because there are millions of these containers that are being transported uh, almost every year yeah, worldwide. And on, once you have this kind of digitized information, you can bring in real-time analytics on top of it. And that's a significant um, benefit if you want to do things like fraud analytics and so on be, uh, once this, this information is digitized and automated on blockchain. So what are some of the challenges, right? So why, so okay, you can b b put it on, on blockchain. What's so difficult about it? Now, the problem here is there is no single data format. There is very little standardization in these documents. So that becomes a huge challenge. And as I mentioned, some of these are, are still, maybe 90% of these documents are still paper documents. People are running around with pieces of paper. Actually, not pieces of paper. It's actually uh, pile loads of paper. And there are too many of these peer-to-peer -peer interactions, right? So there's probably about hundreds of these interactions for any, any given shipment. And there's also an absence of any kind of a messaging standard here. So again, messaging could be phone, email, it could be, uh, it, it could actually be a, a, a standardized EDI kind of a format. There are various different things people are using. And because of these root causes, the challenges becomes that things are error prone. I would think that you would send me an EDI message, but you, you sent me an email and you thought I'd, I'd get the information. So those sorts of things, people, and there's also a lot of copy pasting involved. So I'm, there, there are actually people who have two monitors, they look at one document in one monitor and then physically or manually copy that information into another document, just because the two systems are not integrated. And because of that, there could be inconsistencies in, in, in information. For instance, one document could say, the value of the goods being shipped is $100,000, whereas another document says $110,000. Now, which one do you believe? Right? So those sorts of problems uh, come up. And because you don't know which one to believe, you stop, what, what, stop doing what you're doing, try to figure out why this discrepancy is there. And that causes further delays. And of course, lack of visibility. And because of that, exporter has to call and find out, hey, do you know where my shipment is? Why hasn't it reached the other end? So those sorts of issues happen uh, all the time. So these are the main participants in this ecosystem and uh, shows what are some of the pa their pain points. 
and how potentially blockchain can address them. Almost like the manual uh, uh, steps and paper documentation is probably there for almost everyone. It's a pain point for everyone. Visibility is a common pain point. Security becomes uh, security and trust and, uh, uh, and fraud prevention becomes important for the authorities. So global trade digitization is something that I've personally uh, been leading for the last couple of years. This is, our part this is IBM's partnership with Maersk. So we've uh, created a joint venture with Maersk for building an open, extensible platform for the trade industry. So the goal here is we want to completely revolutionize trade. We want to digitize all of this information. We want to automate them on blockchain. And we want to open this up for people to build applications on top. Right? So that we want to bring all of these ecosystem participants uh, uh, into the into the network, so we have, we have we already have about 20, 25 participants in this uh, in this network, um, and we want to build uh, various applications yeah, uh, on top of this this network. And one of the fundamental things that we are starting to do is provide shared visibility into all the events that are being exchanged in a point to point manner. So that's one of the uh, core uh, applications that we are building. And the other is uh, a, a common shared state. So this is about the documents itself. So can we provide, uh, can we make sure that we are digitizing documents and, and we are providing that shared information, shared um, access to documents to, to, ship, uh, to various participants. And this we are hoping will help increase the speed and transparency for cross-border transactions. And uh, you can have uh, real-time access to exactly what is happening with the container. So for instance, some of the problems that happen is I have meat being shipped in a particular container, but it reaches late and by the time it reaches the, the import side, it, the meat has uh, rotted. Right? So then I don't know exactly where things uh, got messed up, um, so I have no visibility into that. And there's the other angle of all these shipments also get insured. So the insurance agencies are interested in learning exactly where it failed and who was responsible for, for, for the goods to, to be spoiled. So the first application that uh, we are building with global trade digitization is actually called paperless trade, where uh, the goal is to go from manual paper-based processes to digital documents and, and trusted data exchanges for the documents themselves. So this is, think of the documents as a, a manifestation of the cargo itself. So it's going to capture what the cargo is, what the value of the goods are, who are the transacting participants, the approvals that are needed, all those are captured as documents. And we want to provide secure uh, data exchange between people. And we also want to automate those processes, right? What documents are needed, who has to do this. We want to automate that process um, as trusted workflows, as smart contracts on blockchain. And we want to eliminate some of the expenses incurred due to air courier, for instance, um, uh, humans carrying, physically carrying these documents from one company to another and, and so on. So the second uh, application that we are looking uh, to build is a shared visibility of the events happening associated with a particular cargo or a shipment. So today it's all ad hoc message exchanges shown in this, this picture just as a representation. But you want to go from that to a, a, a shared layer on blockchain where each of these entities are, are sharing their events and people can subscribe. So it's almost like a, a pu publish subscribe system um, where people can publish their events and others can subscribe. And again, there is a shared business value in people coming together and sharing the information they have. Today, they might just be sharing it with their next partner, but sharing, in, sharing it in a you know, a decentralized ledger allows a greater visibility and more secure access to, to the data. And you can also ensure it's not tamper-proof, you have the authenticity benefits, uh, you have a lot of those blockchain benefits uh, coming in here. So here are just a, a, an overview of the, some of the documents and events that are needed for at each stage of this, uh, of this uh, shipment. So 3PL is third party logistics. So they are working with a certificate of origin. So this says that the goods actually originated from let's say India, which is the export country. Then there's a packing list that says, okay, this is how we've packed it. So the shipment itself might be packed in different ways and say, and this will have a detailed description of how the goods have been packed. And there's an export declaration. So this has to be uh, provided to the customs authority 
for clearing customs on the export side. And there's a bill of lading, which is also a very important document, uh, which which also has a, a notion of ownership, right? Who owns this document? And it's a it's something that the carrier issues to the exporter or the freight forwarder, saying, "I'm going to be carrying these goods on your behalf, and I will uh, safely get them to the destination." Right? So that'll be the bill of lading, and that has other details also. Um, about might also have specifications of how, about how to handle the shipment. For instance, if it's a fragile shipment, you might say, okay, this shipment should only be placed on top of a container rack. So there are many of these, and then there are events about the shipment reaching a warehouse, reaching a port. What is the temperature of the container? So there's a lot of these events that are that are shared. There are events that are happening, uh, events and documents at the port at the customs authority. So Maersk is the shipping line, so they are actually sending out, uh, sending out a number of uh, events about container opened, container closed, uh, what is the location of the ship that's carrying the container, and so on. Right? So the, you can see uh, the whole range of, this is again a just a representation and a subset of all the things that are happening um, for any given shipment. So I hope this serves to, to uh, express the complexity of this whole ecosystem. Okay, so moving on, so looking at some other uh, issues that face the, the trade logistics world today. So today, uh, think about this, so there's about a third of all container movements across the world today are empty. And why is that? Right? You can, you can, I'll give you some examples. Right? This is largely because of the, the discrepancy in the, in the trade uh, world. So China, for instance, is a huge exporter. They have a huge trade surplus. Uh, with the United States, for instance. So they export a lot of things to the United States and they import very little from. And this has also been the fundamental debate between the US and the Chinese governments, right? And uh, some of the things that uh, President Trump has been bringing in in the United States, some of the tariffs, right? Because of this, this dis discrepancy. So think about this. So all of these exports are going in containers from China to the US. Once they've reached the US, there are a lot of empty containers. They have to travel back empty to China to take the next set of goods, right? So the, all these become empty container shipments. And the same problem kind of happens between, let's say, Brazil and North America. So Brazil is a huge exporter of agricultural goods. So they are actually have uh, refrigerated containers. These are called reefers. And you have to ship these uh, goods from, so the agricultural produce have to go quickly from Brazil to the United States in these refrigerated containers. Uh, they are still fresh when they reach the US. But then there's no one to take those refrigerated containers back. These refrigerated containers, as you might imagine, because they have refrigeration cooling and special sensors in them, they're more expensive than the regular containers. So any goods that are going from US to Brazil, most of them are not agricultural produce, they don't need refrigeration. So why will they pay for these, uh, these uh, more sophisticated containers? So they're going to be shipping in these uh, the regular containers. Now that also brings in discrepancies, right? So what will all these refrigerated containers do once they are in the US? How will they come back? They come back empty. So this is a big problem for the, the shipping lines. So how do I uh, reduce the, and this is all just cost, right? No one's paying to bring back the containers empty. So it's just pure cost for the shipping companies, and if they can, even reduce a fraction of this, it, it improves their, their bottom line, right? So they, that improves their profits. So today, according to estimates, Maersk client spends about a billion dollars just relocating empty containers. So think about it, it's a billion dollars spent yearly just say, shipping empty containers. So if you reduce that, if you can save costs there, that can make a huge difference uh, for their bottom line. So, like I said, what the, some of the constraints are the capacities of containers. So there's a there's a difference in the demand at different locations for these containers, uh, storage capacities, and also the kind of business rules. So, for instance, in the pharma world, there are restrictions that certain these these special um, pharmaceutical drugs should only be carried in, in these kinds of containers. And those containers should not be co contaminated with, with maybe agricultural produce or something else, right? So they should not have germs in them. So these are again special business rules that say that if this particular container should only be used for pharmaceutical goods because it's, it's, been, it's been ensured that it's not, doesn't contain germs and, and other things. 
So there are, there are many of these uh, constraints that make this whole problem very complex. And as of course, you can think of it as an optimization uh, under constraints. So there is a lot of mathematical modeling also that goes on, on how uh, you can reduce the cost of, of some of these empty container movements. So in today's world, what's happening is, uh, maybe I'll step back. So in today's world, some of these ports and even shipping lines, they are bringing in smart hubbing cap capabilities. And what does that mean? So there are many aspects to smart hubbing, but one aspect of it is, can I just, at least in a local ecosystem, so let's take uh, the port of Rotterdam, right, or the Singapore port. So what they do is, at least for, let's, let me connect the containers in, in my region, so there are a lot of shipments maybe coming into uh, Singapore and there might be um, uh, containers going out in, in trucks, in uh, rail lines and so on. Can I have that ecosystem at least share? For instance, I will publish the uh, available container, empty containers and whoever wants to use those containers can, can purchase that. Right? So this ensures, allows sharing of these containers. And they're doing it in, in small pockets, right? So Port of Rotterdam, I think, is doing it. And there are a few other ports that are, that are doing this kind of thing where at least in a local like, ecosystem, they have some sharing of these uh, containers and they publish these availability of empty containers and others can, can take those empty containers. So that's kind of container management is something, again, it's a, it's a neat problem that blockchain can solve. So container owners, and today there are also utilities that rent these containers. So there's, uh, so some of them own them and they rent it out as a business. So now they can publish uh, availability of empty containers. Shipping lines and freight forwarders are the ones who are actually going to move these containers from place A to place B. And the yard owners and the port authority are like the real estate agents. So they are going to be the ones who are going to be uh, storing or or, or storing these containers for a period of time. So the container utilities and owners can publish saying, okay, I have 10 empty containers at this warehouse at this time. And in fact, you can actually do this a priori, right? You know a ship is going to reach um, next week at that particular port. Then you can say, I'm going to have in next week, once the containers are emptied, I'm going to have so many empty containers next week at this location. So if anyone wants to uh, avail of those, then I can have those shipped to your warehouses. So those sorts of uh, at least local, eco local um, optimizations can be done. And of course, once the scales, you can even do this across, across boundaries. So it can actually uh, scale this up to a, a global marketplace for empty container sharing. So this can help reduce the number of empty containers being shipped because now, now someone who shipped from Brazil to the US can use those same containers to bring goods back to, to Brazil. Actually, Merskline has actually started a program on that where reefers take agric agricultural produce from Brazil to the US. And maybe there are other goods, even if you don't need these sophisticated containers, uh, because they're otherwise going to come back empty, they give it to you at a discounted price and allow you to share, uh, allow you to transport even regular goods on the refrigerated containers. So just having that availability of these things known in advance can help optimize this, this overall complex problem. I talked about people are doing some amount of local optimization, so we can actually take this to global optimization if people come and share this information on a blockchain platform. So it can actually build a marketplace for empty containers and, and reefers. And uh, once you have something like this, we can also look at differentiated pricing, right, based on supply and demand. So if at a particular occasion, there's a large amount of large supply, then we can bring down the price. If there's a large demand for empty containers, we can uh, shoot the price up. So that can help optimize this overall problem and bring down the cost for people who are actually doing these empty container shipments, mostly the, the shipping lines. So the, the other kind of uh, issues in the logistics world is on the ports side. So on the ports, think about what the ports do. The ports are almost like a real estate agent. They own the, the critical piece of land around ports and uh, they, they do multiple functions. Of course, when a ship comes in, they have to load containers into the ship or unload containers from the ship. So the loading and uh, unloading happens there. And the um, goal of the port would be to minimize the time the ship spends there. 
So think about it this way. Each time a ship uh, comes in, based on the amount of containers you're loading and unloading, you will be get, you, the port will get paid. Right? So you want to maximize the number of ships that come in at your port. So if you can um, unload and unload from a ship very quickly, you can have a very quick turnaround. Then you can have more ships coming in. Right? So it becomes, uh, again, an optimization problem there. So the shipping lines also, they are interested in loading and unloading very quickly because it, it is an energy cost also for them because these ships uh, consume a massive amount of, uh, of fuel to run and uh, it helps them to, to optimize. For instance, one of the things that they don't want to do is reach the port and find out that maybe cranes are not available to load and unload or even maybe the port uh, workers are not available. So it's useful to have an estimate of when exactly the ship will reach and accordingly optimize operations of the port or vice versa. Right? If you know that the port is only going to give you a berth to, to dock, uh, let's say three days from now, so accordingly you can adjust the, the pace at which you go over sea. Right? Because you know you're going, to get, um, you're going to get a slot only in three days, maybe you go slower right? and that can help save on fuel. So there are a lot of these optimizations that are happening even today, but they're very manual, right? They're very manual decisions that, okay, over a phone call, you'll get to know that it's, uh, it's going to take three days for you to, to, to get a berth. And so then the, doc, the captain will decide, okay, instead of reaching in two days, I will go slowly and I'll, I'll reach in three days. So those sorts of things happen or, or uh, uh, vice versa also, right? The captain can speed up. So instead of doing uh, some of those things extremely manually and doing like local optimizations, if you can have some of this information again shared on a blockchain, blockchain platform amongst multiple ecosystem participants, then again you can do much better optimization and cost reduction for some of these operations. Uh, so that's this kind of what I talked about, blockchain for port operations. It allows the ports to optimize uh, their utilization of, of cranes and workers and, and so on. And um, it, they allow, allow the ports to, to operate more ships uh, quickly. So some of the, there are few ports in the world that are very, very efficient. And because they are very efficient, more ships will also prefer to, to, to go through them. Right? And for the shipping lines, it's great because it helps optimize. They can, have, you can, do the, they can optimize voyage speed and arrive at the port just in time. Okay. And um, so the shipping lines benefit by pub would be publishing this information, but they are also getting information back from the port. So there's a, there's a good um, exchange of information between uh, ports, uh, ports and then operators at the port and uh, freight forwarders and shipping lines. Okay, so hope that gives you a flavor of the kinds of use cases that uh, people are looking at in the logistics space. There's a lot of these use cases around, people are experimenting with them. Um, so there's a short video about uh, IBM and Maersk collaboration on cross-border supply chain and trade. So you should look at, you should check out that video. It gives you a good overview of things. And there's a, a noteworthy startup. So the startup called Wave, they're uh, aggressively trying to digitize a number of documents, especially the bill of lading, which is a very important document in the trade world. So I'd, I'd encourage you to check out what they are doing in this space as well. So they're digitizing documents and they're also bringing in blockchain to have a secure shared view of, of information. With that, thanks a lot. Um, we'll see you in the next lecture talking about more use cases in the supply chain space. Thank you.